what up, what up? Come on, what up, church by the glaze? Let's go ahead and start this thing off right. If you know that God is good all the time, let me hear you make some noise. Awesome. Man, you guys are awesome. You look good. You may be seated. Man, I'm telling you, I, uh, I be so hyped when I come here. I'm telling you, after I, uh, I kind of come here and speak at Church by the Glade, it's really hard to go other places because uh, nobody gives me that warm greeting like you guys do, and you guys are awesome. I just want to tell you that. Um, we're going to start by welcoming everybody joining us all around the world online. So many people join us. Go ahead and give it up to everybody joining us at uh, Dade CI. We got Homestead. We got those that are joining. Literally, I see Dubai, LA, people joining us from everywhere, Oklahoma City, Kansas City. Give a hand clap for everybody joining all around the world online. I know I'm there every week. Go ahead and type in the chat and let us know where you're joining from. It's so good to be with you. For those, those of you guys that may be new, maybe you're uh, what I call either a CEO or uh, you're a CME. In other words, you come to, to church on Christmas and Easter only, or maybe you come to church on Christmas, Mother's Day and Easter, but you're here the following week, so we are glad that you guys are here. Your family, when you come the first time, you're a guest. Every time after that, you're family. So let's welcome everybody that's coming back and all the new folks that are visiting. We're gonna have you come down here in a minute, tell us your name and all your deepest secrets. Just play it, but uh, uh, my name is Scott Williams. I bring you greetings from the great state of Oklahoma, the city of Oklahoma City, and I, I'm not a guest here anymore. I'm family. This is my favorite church in the world. I love you guys. I love being here, and it's always an honor to be able to uh, to share God's word. And I just want to, those of you guys that have been here for a while and maybe you're new and you think what's going on at Church by the Glaze, like this is just normal. I just want to let you guys know, I don't want you guys to take uh, for granted what God is doing here. It's absolutely crazy. I mean, even last week, Easter here, you heard the numbers. Pastor Charlie did a phenomenal message. I mean, uh, you, I mean, every single time he preaches, it's just always amazing. And here's the, like, you're just spoiled because you have some of the greatest communicators. More importantly, you have great leaders. Pastor Dave, and Leach are some of my favorite friends and ministry leaders in the world. They're good people. They're salt of the earth. I'm from Oklahoma. We say you're good people. That means like that's, that's the highest compliment that you can get. What you see on stage is what you get off stage. And Pastor Davis' message last week over First Baptist Fort Lauderdale, he was talking about this specific assignment that God has for each and every one of our lives. And I'm just here to tell you that it, you are like the assignment that God has on your pastor's lives and as a result that he has on your lives because you're a part of this church is absolutely phenomenal. What God did at First Baptist Fort Lauderdale is absolutely crazy. I'm here to tell you, as I was preparing for, yeah, you can go ahead and hand clap for that. I'm telling you, you can hand clap for that. You know, I'm going to get into what I'm preaching. I'm, I'm going to be, we're going to look at the book of Luke. But as I was reading Luke and I was studying, preparing, it reminded me as I, I came through some stories and came through some scripture, it reminded me of what's going on in the life of this church right now, and specifically at First Baptist Fort Lauderdale. It's Luke 8, and Jesus had been performing some miracles. He's performing these miracles. These miracles were happening. You may have read the story. You had the, the woman with the issue of blood who was uh, subject to bleeding for, for 12 years and was looking to be healed. She touched the, the crest but on the edge of Jesus cloaked the hem of his garment and she was immediately healed and then there's a synagogue leader the religious leader of the day Jairus and his daughter was sick and he was trying to get his daughter to Jesus he was trying to get his daughter to Jesus like she was dying and finally everybody's like she's dead don't bother the teacher anymore and I'm here to tell you, I'm going to quote what Jesus said. Jesus told them, she's not dead, but asleep. I'm here to tell you that they said First Baptist Fort Lauderdale was dead. There was 160 people meeting there. There was a flood that happened there. It used to be the big church in downtown Fort Lauderdale. But I'm here to tell you, it ain't dead. It's just asleep. And I don't know what you came in here with today. Maybe you came in here with some vision. Maybe you came in here with some dreams. Maybe you came in and you want to start that business. Maybe you wanted to rekindle that relationship. Whatever that is that you were going after, whatever that thing is that you wanted to rise up, I'm here to tell you right now, it ain't dead. It's just asleep. I ain't even started preaching yet. I'm just saying, like, like well, that ain't even a, that's a text that I'm preaching on, but uh, I just don't want you guys to miss that. You're seeing a modern day miracle. Like all some of you guys, like, oh, we're, we're given to what God is doing at First Baptist Fort Lauderdale. 
We get to come out here to the Sawgrass camps. We get to attend online. Literally, church had 160 people less than a year ago. Back to capacity. Because I'm telling you, when God's hand is on something, there's nothing that anybody can do to stop it. And God's hand is clearly on the work that's going on here. I'm, I'm trying. And, and the reason why when I teach, I like to tell stories is because that's what Jesus did. More uh, Scholars say that a third of Jesus' teaching was what they call parables. And what parable is, is it's a story. What he'll do is he'll tell a story on something that's familiar, and he'll pull out a biblical truth. And so the time that we're going to look at in Scripture today, that's what Jesus was doing. He was speaking to the, the religious leaders of the day, and, and the, these Pharisees were there. And, and what he did is he told some, some parables. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at Luke 15. If you have your Bibles, you can go there. And there's three parables that Jesus tells right in a row. So that's, that's your homework. Go, go read them all together. We're going to specifically focus on one. But I do think it's important to highlight all three of them because he tells them right in a row. And the first one is the, is the, the parable of the lost sheep. And one thing about this and what Jesus was so brilliant about, he made sure that what he said connected to everyone. And so the parable of the lost sheep, because in this time, like, the men were generally shepherds. So you had men and, and, and young men, they could relate to the, the parable of the lost sheep because the shepherd is out there, they're looking for the sheep. So the men could connect with that easily. Everybody could, but the men specifically. And then he told the parable of the lost coin. And there's a woman that had her wedding necklace, and it was 10 coins on the wedding necklace. And so that means that all 10 were there. She was able to get married. But she lost one of the coins, and they were very, very expensive. It'd be a, it could be like two or three years' worth of wages for her to get enough to have that coin again to be able to get married. And, and so you think about it. They said that she put the light on. She's tearing up the crib. She's looking for everything, right? I mean, ladies, think about this. If you was ready to get married, and all of a sudden you couldn't get married because you got to wait another two or three years because you can't find a coin— you like, the devil is a liar. We're going to find that coin. <laughs> Some of y'all been waiting two months and you're ready. Like, you just met him. You know what I'm saying? Y'all just met. You know, went on three days. I'm ready to get married. No, you ain't. <laughs> and then the last one is the story of the, the prodigal son or the lost son. So that one women can relate to, right? The last one. But the prodigal son, it's the parents and the children. In other words, every single one of us, every single one of you watching, those in the top of the balcony, we can all relate to that story because it's a story of the lost son. But in each and every one of those stories, what happens is that when they come back or when they find the coin is they celebrate. They throw a big party and they celebrate because celebrating finding something that's lost is really important. And that's what the text is what we're going to look at today. And so we're going to look at the story of the, the lost sheep. And you think about it in this time, so Jesus is depicted as the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the, the phenomenal shepherd. He's, the Lord is my shepherd. And so he refers to himself as the, the shepherd in the parable of the lost sheep. In John 10, 11, he says that I am the good shepherd and I give my, I give my life for the sheep. Hebrews 13, 20, Paul calls him the great shepherd of the sheep. 1 Peter 5, 4, Peter calls him the chief shepherd. And one of the, the more familiar passages in the Bible and the, one of the most quoted psalms in all of the Scripture is, is the one that where he may, you may have recited it growing up. Some of you guys may have heard it at a funeral. As a pastor, I, I've read it at a funeral. And again, whether it's early or late, no matter where it's at the beginning to end, but it begins with this life-changing statement from David's Psalm 23. And it says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's really enough, like the Lord is my shepherd, and because he's my shepherd, because he's the one that's guiding me, the Lord is my shepherd. As a result of that, I shall not want. And so today we're going to look at the story of the lost sheep in Luke 15. And, and during these times, I think it's important to note that, that Jesus was, was hanging with, uh, with the sinners, he was hanging with, he, had to, he, was, he was walking around with a t-shirt on that said, no perfect people allowed. <laughs> that, that's actually, I don't know if you guys know, that's where Pastor David got that. He had an old, old picture of Jesus back in the day. 
I'm just lying, but he might as well have. Some of y'all are like, wow. Mom, did you see that? Y'all got to come to church more than Christmas and Easter to know I'm just lying. You know what I'm saying? But, but he said, but he was hanging out with the, the sinners. And you think about in his time, like, that there was the Pharisees never looking. Like, if you looked at it, they lined up these different people. Like, you had the sinners. Like, and then you had the, the, the shepherds were right there in this hierarchy of just, like, tax collectors, sinners, and, and shepherds. They were all kind of viewed the same. Like, the religious leaders like, kind of looked down at them. And I'm going to be honest, like, as I was reading this text, like, normally, like, I think it's important that we don't just, like, look at the Bible and, like, want to change it because the Word of God is the Word of God. But again, I only do one thing. I only keep it one way, and that's what? A hundred. A buck. And I'm just being honest. When I was reading, it's like, geez, this is the one time that I want to insert. I wish this is what you would have said in the Scriptures. You know, the Pharisees are hating on the tax collectors. I wish you would have said, look, I get it. You don't like the tax collectors. I don't like them either. We're just going to do away with all tax collection. No more IRS. You know what I'm saying? Like, Y'all going to hell right along with me for wanting to change scripture. Yes, change the scriptures. <laughs> but Jesus, he's sitting there talking to me like, what are you doing hanging out with these sinners? And again, like, I, I, I think they're like, what, what are you doing? The, 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 the Pharisees, they're, they're saying this to Jesus. And I don't know exactly how it sounded, but I, I imagine like, this, I feel like the Pharisees are like, oh my gosh, do you see this guy? Look at him. I, I know he's over there hanging with the, look at their shirts. The shirts say, I'm not perfect. Like, what is he doing hanging with? She says that she was a stripper. Oh, my gosh. Dude, what is he doing hanging with them people? Oh, he was getting drunk last night. Oh, my God. Like, well, this guy cannot be a good guy. He's, who is he? What is he doing? I don't know why it's that accent, but that accent just seems to work, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> For some really elite people, right? So he's hanging with the sinners, and they're hating on him, right? And I love what Jesus does. Like, he, Jesus is just like, you know what I'm saying? He's just so, like, gangster, right? Like, they, they trip and call him out. He knows it. He hears them. Instead of being like, yo, man, y'all tripping. Man, what's, what y'all want to do? Like, I, yeah, I'm hanging with them. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He, he gets real deep. And that's where he tells them this, this, this parable. And that's what we're going to pick up in Luke 15, verses 3 through 7. I'm going to read these five verses, and we'll come back and unpack them a few verses at a time. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 and go in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And so that's why when people are wondering, like, why does Church by the Glades do what it does? Why do you have trapezes and people shooting out of cannons and, and fire and all this kind of stuff? I mean, you don't know what you're going to see on this stage. Why is there a gazillion billion LEDs and all this stuff? All of these things are because they want to do exactly what Jesus was trying to tell them in this parable. They're trying to go after the one. As a matter of fact, the title of today's message, I think, like, who is the one? The title of today's message is... I am the one. Why don't you turn around to your neighbor right now and say, I am the one. Turn around to your other neighbor, your second choice. <laughs> turn around to your second choice and say, I am the one. Last thing, turn around to the person behind you and say, I am the one. <laughs> Yo, hey, ma'am, ma'am, like, I know, like, here's the deal. Next week, y'all are starting a relationship series with Pastor David. is going to be back, and it's called Fearless, and it's going to be about relationships, how to do relationships God way. It's going to be about family and all that, so you'll want to be here. And I don't know, this lady right here, when she turned around, she turned, and the guy, the, the guy was turned around behind, and she looked at him and said, I ain't the one. You know what I'm saying? Like, ma'am, 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 it's the rela he ain't trying to holler, ma'am. He was just, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, I ain't the one. She's like, I ain't the one. I, I don't know if you guys know this, but I can read lips up here. I can read. When y'all are whispering to one another, like, ma'am, I see you recording right there. You ain't got to hold the phone like this. Put it up. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I, I, I think y'all think I don't see y'all, right? Like I, I really do. Like, no, you're good. Like, it's good. Like, I promise you. But it's funny because I be looking at y'all sometimes like, yo, man, I see you. 
Y'all don't be, and when you, I'm telling you right now, if you fall asleep when I'm preaching, I don't even try to like be loud and wake you up because you must have had a really rough night. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, gl I'm glad you're here. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Where was I at? Okay. Uh, you know, I was, um, never mind. Let's go back to the, fir the first thing. <laughs> the first thing you've been taking notes. Here, here's the three things that Jesus does for the one. Everybody say three things. The first thing you're taking notes is this, is he, he searches for the one. Verse 3 and 4. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 and go into the open country after the lost sheep until he finds it? I think that's really important to think about. So it says that. If one of the sheep are lost, like he goes after, he leaves the 99 and goes after the one. And as I'm looking at the text, I, I think that's really important because it says that he leaves the 99 and goes after the one. And so in my mind, I start thinking like, what is the lost sheep? Like, what are the different types of lost? And so as I was trying to contemplate and, and remediate and investigate what it means to have the different types of loss, I came up with this very, very scholarly answer of the three types of lost. I didn't do all that, I just made it up. I'm just saying, but like, <laughs> the three types of loss is gonna be an acronym of dog. Like the first type of loss is like, you're just kinda lost, you're what I call dabbling. And some of you guys, that's where you find yourself right now, you're just kinda dabbling in sin, that line of sin is right here, and you're just dabbling in it. You're just dabbling in those DMs. You just dabbling with that drug use. You just dabbling with the drinking and, and driving. You just dabbling with a little bit of cheating. Like what are the things? Like you know what it is? Like you're just dabbling, like like with, with with worry and letting all that stuff get to you. Like you're just dabbling in that, you know. And that's one type of loss. And then the next type of loss, have you been dabbling? Next type of loss is what I call out there. And when, you, when you're out there, that means you clearly, you stepped across the line and you're out there. So you're beyond the dabbling. You could go back to dabbling. You could go back on the other side, but you're out there. And some of you guys, that's where you have some family members and friends right now and they're out there. Many of you, you used to be out there. Some of you, I'm glad you're here because you are out there. So the question, what are you going to do when, you, when you're out there? Then the next type, if you're gonna, again, it's going to spell dog. The next type is G and they just gone. How many guys you know somebody like, man, what's going on with someone? Oh man, oh, she just, she gone, man. <laughs> like what, like why, why is he doing that? Like, <laughs> he's gone. And I'll be honest with you, like I used to like the, like the, the Yeezus and Jesus Kanye. I used to like that Kanye, right? And then it just seems like, like Kanye started dabbling recently, started dabbling, and, and this isn't just Kanye, there seems to be a lot of dabbling going on out there. Anyway, that's another sermon for another day. I'm gonna leave that alone because we're gonna keep this on Jesus. But then next thing you know, you got some people that are, that are out there, and then just like what we're hearing about a lot of people, a lot of people just seem to be all the way gone. And you can't be all the way gone if you wanna make sure that you're trying to be found because one thing about a lost sheep the only way the lost sheep is going to be found is it has to make a decision to be found. Because here's the deal, like I, I've studied, yeah, you can clap for that. I've studied about sheep so much in preparing for this message, I feel like I'm a sheepologist. <laughs> I didn't know so many things about sheep. I don't think, I don't know if you guys knew this, but you know, they, they, they describe us as sheep throughout the scripture or whatever. You think about the sheep, like it's crazy, like oh, so many sheep. There, did you guys know that there's thousands of types of sheep? And they come in different sizes and shapes and colors and have different types of wool and they do different types of things. Did you guys know that? I didn't either. Did you know that sheeps can remember like hundreds and thousands of faces, human faces and other sheep faces and other animal faces? I didn't know it either. Did you know that sheep have uh, horizontal pupils and so they can literally see almost 360 degrees without even turning their head? Did you guys know that about sheep? I didn't either. I didn't know all of these things about sheep. Did you guys know that when the, the, the sheep have what they call a flocking instinct, so they try to stay together and they stay together and they move in groups, but then when they get out of the groups and they get lost, it's really hard for them to be found because they don't know what to do when they're lost. And then when they get lost, the reason why the shepherd goes after them so much is you know why? Because when they get 
get lost? If they say they stumble and they trip and they're out there and they lost, did you know that if a sheep falls over and it gets on its back, it's something they call cast syndrome or cast down syndrome. And when they're stuck on their back, they can't get up. And so they're subject to predators and all that. There's all these different things that I learned about sheep, but it reminded me that that's the same thing that we need to know about us. That here's the, like there's all, we come in all different shapes and sizes and colors, and we have a flocking instinct. And if we find ourselves outside of the flock and we're not in community, we can get lost and we can get cast down and we can get stuck. And if we don't find ourselves and somebody don't help us up, we subject to a predator or we're what? Gone. Gone. So you got to make sure you think about it. So I, again, as I started learning so much about it, it's just kind of crazy. Like when you get disconnected from the group and what they will do is that a, at a shepherd will, will use this, this staff, right? And this is called a shepherd's staff. You may have heard it called a crook or a rod. And so they're able to use it to walk in like heavy terrain and, and to get around. But what they also will do is like that if a sheep can, it starts getting a little bit out of line, they will, they will prod and, and poke the sheep and just make sure like just, po just poke, hey, hey, come on, get on over here. And Jim, the sheep will kind of get back in line. And then what they'll do sometimes if they're all stuck together, they need to move one, is they will take and they'll put it underneath and they'll take and he'll push the sheep up and kind of get them out of the way. Or if they, so they'll prod and they'll tap it then. If they're trying the other thing they'll do, they'll go and they'll just, they'll just tap the sheep. Hey, hey, get, get a guy outside. And so the sheep are like, you know, they respond very, very well. And so they'll tap them. But the other thing that they will do is they will use the crook, the hook part of the sheep. And say so you get way out of line and they go and what they'll do is they'll either pull them up and grab them by their body or they will use it gently and they will grab it around their neck. They'll grab it around their neck because the, the shepherd is trying to make sure that you don't get out of bounds. He's trying to, to protect you because what we got to understand is that correction is protection. And we got to be willing to listen to the good shepherd. I'm here to tell you right now, many of you guys, like you've had that situation where the good shepherd was, he was prodding you and telling you don't do that. He was poking you and telling you don't do that. And many of you, he put some pressure around your neck. And you felt claustrophobic and you didn't know what to do. And you got frustrated. And you got angry because you didn't want to respond to the correction. Again, correction is protection. Many of you guys, if you would have listened to the correction, you wouldn't have had the baby by that guy that's no good. Or you wouldn't be in drug and alcohol rehab. I mean, let's just keep it a buck. Like, like here's the deal. Very few people just get underneath the thing and just jump out here and they're outside the group and they're just doing it generally like they prod, prod, hey, stop this, do that. But we don't want to respond, but we got to make sure that we're responding because that's what the good shepherd wants us to do. And so you think about it. So when you get lost and you're out there, what do you do? Like, again, because like some of you guys know I used to work in the prison system. I used to work in corrections. And people think that, like, in corrections, if you go to jail, when you go to jail, how many phone calls do you get when you go to jail? Three. Like, we're always told one, as a former warden, that ain't true, but we're just going to use it like it's true for this illustration, right? <laughs> ain't true. But you get the one phone call, so some of you guys think about, like, who are you going to call? You're going to call your, your girlfriend, your baby's mama, your girl, your old girl, your side chick, your friend, your Amy, your pastor. Who are you going to call, right? And here's the, like, whoever you call, they may answer and they may not. But there's also a chance if they, if they don't answer, if they do answer, they don't have the correct answer. But I'm here to tell you this, like when you're out there and you're lost, the only way you're going to be found is you got to pick up the phone and call Jesus. And many of you guys like, that's what you need to do. You need to call Jesus. This is a universal symbol. You need to call Jesus. As a matter of fact, this is going to be the hand symbol. Like I want everybody to take your hand and put it up to your ear like you're making a phone call. Then look up. That's the official call Jesus sign, right? Matter of fact, you, my lady with the phone, everybody, you can take out your phones right now. You can take a picture of this, and you can share it with your people and just say, this is the official call. Matter of fact, you can even use these emojis, use the hang loose and what they call the rolling off. That's the looking up to Jesus for us, because we're going to claim that in the name of Jesus. Matter of fact, take a picture right now. You can post on Instagram, whatever, and you're going to do this. Everybody do this and look up. That's called Jesus, right, right? And here's the cool thing, like, when next time your friend, they make trip and they come and give you all this stuff, like, what you going to do? You better be like... 
better call Jesus, you know what I'm saying? Like, like call Jack Sears, like, share, because people need to hear this. They see it, be like, who do you need to call? Next time somebody get all these questions, whatever, you be like. <laughs> because again, you don't need the phone, like literally, some of you guys, like, this is gonna bless you, because you ain't even gotta say nothing. They, they come in, they trip, and they doing all this, what are you gonna say? And some of you gonna get real gangster with it, because they out there, they trip, you like. I didn't even have to say nothing. He'd be like, yo, dog, you tripping. You better call Jesus. You know what I'm saying, right? Everybody practice. Everybody say it without even saying anything. That's it. Like, I'm telling you, that's, you're going to be able to use that. Your new emojis, put that in your emoji group. Like, like they tripping. They got whatever. You, instead of you tripping on somebody's post, all you got to do is do that and this. They're going to think you're talking about Hawaii and rolling your eyes, but they don't know. You're going to let them know you're talking about calling Jesus. Because if we're trying to get to the other side, who will we need to call? We need to call Jesus. Come on, let's give a hand clap and we're going to call Jesus today. All right, second thing, if you're taking notes, is this. Second thing he does is he carries the one. Everybody say carries the one. Verse 5 and the first of verse 6. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and does what? And goes home. So you think about it like he's made, he goes out, he finds a sheep, and he puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Because you think about it, like, in order for the sheep to be found, it has to want to be found. Because many of you guys, like, Jesus can be standing in front of you right now. And he's saying, come, if you and I are making the decision, say, all right, man, I'm going to call you. I'm going to go with you. It, it's not going to happen. And so you have to want to be found. It reminds me that when I worked in the prison system, I worked for a private corrections company. I, I remember me and the president were out in West Texas looking at some land to buy to build some prisons. And as we were out there and we were kind of going through and, and we were looking at different land out there and, and, and as we were looking at different land, like remember we were with the farmer, it was the farmer that owned the land, it was myself and the president of the truck and we're going, there's a whole bunch of sheep out on the land. And as I'm out there, I'm looking at the land or whatever and I, I didn't see any sheep dog. You know, like border collies, they know them, they're really good at, at, at getting the sheep together. And so I asked the farmer, I said, where are the sheep dogs at? He said, oh, we don't use sheep dogs anymore. He said, uh, what we do is we just put the feet on the back of the truck and then drive and they follow us. He said, we learned a long time ago that it's much easier to pull them than it is to push them. And I'm here to tell you, that's what Jesus only reminds you today. It's much easier for him to pull you than it is for him to push you. So he's trying to pull you along with his word. You're, you're coming to church. You're listening to the word of God. You're being inspired. You're being encouraged. And he's trying to pull you along because pushing never works. That's why those preachers on the corner don't ever change lives because they trying to say that. Here's the deal. We, we can't stand the perfect people where church by the glades is saying there's no perfect people allowed. We're going to pull you along the way. We're going to give you into God's word. We're going to get you into community. So when he finds you, it's not about where he finds you. It's about where he's taking you to. He may have found you in anxiety and stress, but he's taking you to peace. He may have found you in loneliness and isolation, but he's taking you into life groups. He may have found you with relationship issues, but he's taking you out of toxicity and he's taking you into fruitful, meaningful relationships. He may take you out of the grief and loss with the reassurance that no matter what you went through, that God still has something for you. It may be some financial issues. He may be taking you from broken in debt to finding financial peace. It may be taking you from your health problems to finding some peace and some healing in whatever situation you got. He may be taking you from spiritual doubt and identity crisis to finding reassurance assurance and the love that can only be found in Christ Jesus. It's not about where he's finding you, it's about where he's taking you to. The last thing if you're taking notes, last thing he does is he celebrates when the one is done. Verse 6, the end of verse 6 and verse 7. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, in other words, he calls his friends and neighbors and say, yo, let's celebrate. Like, I found the lost sheep. Look at it. Let's celebrate. That's what he does. Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over the sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. 
in all three stories, the key element is, in all three of these parables, is there's a celebration. When they find the sheep, when she finds the coin, and when the prodigal son returns home. There's a celebration. There's a celebration, and it's celebration. We, the church, the body, the family, the community, the group's like, hey, I'm getting my friends and neighbors. You're going to celebrate. And I think that's really, really important because when you think about it, like he's talking about for the one who repents. And if you look at that, that word, I think what's important is, is to understand is this, is that the word repent, it literally means to, to turn around to turn around and return to Jesus. And the way I tell people to remember, these words don't go together like this, but the word penthouse, if you think penthouse, it's generally which floor? It's the top floor. It's the top floor. So what he's saying is you're going to go, you're going to go, and you're going to turn around and go to the top floor. And this is when the band's going to play behind me to make me sound more spiritual as I close. And so as you turn around, we want you to repent, to turn around and go to God. Because here's what's happened. And many of you guys, like as, as, you're, as you're, you're dabbling and or your friends, they're dabbling and next thing you know, they're, they're out there and they go from being out there and they go from being out there. Next thing you know, they're what? They're, they're, they're gone. And the one thing about when you're gone, and if you look at that, that's spelled dog. But if you take that dog and you flip it around backwards and you turn around and it's backwards, what does it spell? It spells G-O-D. And that's what you got to do you got to turn around and turn to God because what happens is is what we'll do is we'll change just enough to be forgiven and we'll turn just enough to be forgiven but we won't truly repent in order for us to truly be changed and turn to God and that's what we got to be willing to do we got to say you know what God like I'm willing to do what I'm willing to call on the name of Jesus I'm willing to get, pick up the phone and call Jesus you know we sang a worship song earlier and what did it say it said I want you to speak Jesus I want you to speak the name of Jesus so what I want us to do all across this room, I want us to stand on our feet. I want us to band. I want, we're going to go back into that song, and we're going to worship knowing that, that Jesus is relentlessly pursuing you because you know what? You are the one. I am the one. But more importantly, what Jesus wants me to tell you today is that he is the one. He is the one that can change things. It doesn't matter what mountains you're on, whatever situation you're on. Jesus in the street. We're going to worship. Jesus in the darkness. All across this room. Here's Jill. You'll lift your hands. That in Miami Dolphins game to cheer, Jesus but we're going to lift our hands and we're going to praise Jesus from the front to the back of the room. you got to speak the name of Jesus because Jesus is the name that's going to change things. I don't know what you got today, what you came in here with today. Your name is power. Come on, the power can be found in the name of Jesus. You need healing? You need that situation to turn around? Yeah, you're Put your hands in the name of Jesus.